Don't talk before the meeting. <laughs> then uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it, but it's me, um, <laughs> and I think that guy will 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 speak after me. Um, the, the next uh, part of the session is to deal with progression from polycythemia or ET to myelofibrosis, and then Guy will give the, the more important uh, part of the talk. My function here is just to set the scene um, on a clinical level as to what Guy will be talking about, and I will hopefully make up some of our time that I caused you to lose this morning. So a very brief outline. We'll define what is meant by progression. Um, I've already implied that sometimes this is unclear. Sometimes there's a continuum, and progression isn't necessarily linear, but it can sometimes be circular. The incidence of progression, the clinical features that we might expect to see in our patients together with the laboratory features of progression, how we manage patients who progress from the more indolent forms of MPN like ET or PV to myelofibrosis, which as I implicated earlier was a more aggressive form of MPN, um, and apart from the management, how prognosis might be affected by progression. So firstly, in terms of defining progression, Perhaps the best definition we have are those that are uh, offered to us by the International Working Group for MPN. And we see over here in the left panel, polycythemia vera that progresses to what is called post-polycythemia vera myelofibrosis. And on the right-hand side, essential thrombocythemia, which progresses to post-essential thrombocythemia myelofibrosis. Again, we have these diagnostic criteria. So there are required criteria. The first criterion, which is fairly self-evident, is that we have to have an underlying disease either PV or ET, as defined by the WHO criteria that we mentioned this morning. The second, again, self-evident criterion that has to be present is fibrosis. We're talking about post-PV fibrosis, therefore we need PV and we need fibrosis. Post-ET fibrosis, we need ET and we need fibrosis. Fibrosis is a bone marrow biopsy diagnosis that is made by a pathologist. And the pathologist will grade fibrosis in the bone marrow. Fibrosis is essentially scar tissue. Uh, which forms in the uh, bone marrow and can be graded uh, on a level of 0 to 3 or 0 to 4, depending on two different scales which pathologists may use. Here we need 2 out of 3 on a grade of up to 3, or 3 or 4 on a grade of 0 to 4. There are additional requirements, 2 for PV and 2 for ET. And for PV, it's anemia, or all of a sudden you don't need to do phlebotomies in patients with polycythemia vera the hemoglobin stays stable without treatment. You can reduce doses of cytoreductive drugs like hydroxyurea or interferon. So that is criteria number one. Criteria number two would be something called leukoerythroblastocytosis, which means that the blood smear, as seen under a microscope, will change in its nature. Uh, we'll see early forms of white cells and early forms of red cells appearing in the peripheral blood. The spleen increases in size and symptoms develop. And we have similar things appearing in the uh, ET panel over here. Just for those who are particularly interested, you'll see an extra criterion here, which is that enzyme, the LDH level, the lactate dehydrogenase level may increase, particularly in patients in ET, as a sign of transformation to myelofibrosis. It does not appear in the PV panel simply because patients with PV often a priori will have elevated levels of LDH. So in a patient who you think has ET, who then develops increased LDH levels, one should be on the alert that they may be developing post-ET myelofibrosis. The incidence, 10% of patients with PV at 10 years, and only about 4% of patients with myelofibrosis will develop myelofibrosis from ET. Again, echoing what I mentioned this morning, PV seems to be a more aggressive or more malignant phenotype than ET a priori. The clinical features... Usually, this is something that develops insidiously. In other words, it'll take time. It'll be something that you as a clinician will notice over perhaps months or maybe even a year or more. However, it can sometimes occur very rapidly, um, and a patient can decline quickly, and your initial diagnosis may be that the patient is transformed to a much more aggressive disease like acute leukemia. However, on ev evaluation, such as bone marrow biopsy, you might find fibrosis. So it can occur quite rapidly. The symptoms that the patient will develop are the so-called constitutional symptoms, which include weight loss, sweating, fevers, general fatigue, not feeling well, and the spleen, as mentioned previously, grows so that splenomegaly, one enlarged spleen, will be one of the clinical features. The laboratory features I've alluded to as well, decreased in the blood counts because the bone marrow progressively fails to produce cells, but as I mentioned this morning, high white counts and high plated counts can also confuse you and develop 
while the patient is developing their myelofibrosis. So really, any change in the blood count may be uh, important. I mentioned the f findings that we have on microscopy. Abnormal red blood cells, so-called teardrops, they look like teardrops, fragmented red blood cells, normoblasts, which are normally found in the bone marrow, may escape the bone marrow and in enter the peripheral blood, as may white blood cells producing what is called a so-called left shift in the white cells. Those findings together are called leukoerythroblastic findings in the peripheral blood. And I mentioned that the LDH level is a defining feature of transformation in patients with ET. Management uh, aligns fairly much with management of myelofibrosis uh, as a primary disease, and that is if the patient is symptomatic, you need to treat them. And today we are um, in an era where we use JAK inhibitors, such as ruxolitinib and uh, hopefully now as well fedratinib, uh, for patients who are symptomatic with myelofibrosis, be it primary or transformed myelofibrosis. In patients who are, have, uh, have an appropriate clinical profile and a donor of stem cells, we'll look to do allogeneic stem cell transplantation as a curative procedure, which is really the only curative procedure for these patients. And of course, um, as we heard in the previous talk, and as I mentioned earlier, supportive care, taking care of patients' symptomatic needs is uh, essential for all patients. How about the prognosis? And with this, I will end. I mentioned this morning that we have a number of uh, uh, prognostic scoring systems uh, which we'll talk about in one of the later talks. Here is the only one that is specific for um, secondary myelofibrosis. This is the MISEC score. Myelofibrosis secondary is what MISEC stands for. Um, and the way you deal with this is you look at these variables over here. Again, very simple variables. The hemoglobin, the platelets, the blast cells, which are early white blood cells that are not meant to be in peripheral blood, but if they appear, you get a very high score, two points for that. Does the patient have a calreticulin mutation or not? WT stands for wild type. That's the geneticist's uh, term used for a normal calreticulin gene. So if the patient has a normal calreticulin gene, that's actually bad. Turns out, ironically and quite somewhat paradoxically, that having calreticulin mutations in myeloproliferative neoplasms is actually a good prognostic variable. So not having the calreticulin is bad. And then does the patient have con constitutional symptoms? You can score anywhere from zero to eight if you sum all of those. The patient's age is not in this um, uh, list of features over here, but age is always important, older age being uh, a negative uh, pro prognostic feature in all scoring systems. And here is where age comes into it. So on the x-axis of this nomogram, we have age. On the y-axis, we have the sun. And then you can move along. And if you have a 60-year-old patient who has four points, they will be blue, which is intermediate one, they may have more points to become purple, and the worst obviously being red, with the most favorable prognosis being in this green area over here. So it's very simple. It's something that you can do uh, in the clinic easily. As I mentioned this morning, we get calreticular mutation on all of these patients. So these are very easily uh, accessible uh, variables. And we can easily plot our patients over here into one of these four uh, categories. And this is my last slide. And this is the implication of being in one of those particular groups. This is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve for patients who are at low risk, intermediate one, intermediate two, and high risk. And you saw curves like this this morning. Uh, they're very similar. And you get your number of years over here that patients will survive. So if a patient is at low risk, in other words, they're young and have very few of those features, even though they have a secondary myelofibrosis, they have a very good prognosis, and they probably will not need very aggressive treatment. And again, if we look at the high risk and intermediate two group who have a lot of those ad adverse risk factors, we'll see these are patients that we would really like to have some aggressive intervention available for uh, so that we can change the natural history and the clinical course of their disease. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.